says, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. So let's do that, church. Let's rise and stand and worship our holy God. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer some empower our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power our God, our God. Then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? How many of you had to rely this week on our awesome God who was stronger than the situations before you? Yeah, me too. Me too. We'll talk more about that a little bit later this morning. 
Thanks, everybody, for coming as we're gathered in God's house to worship Him. If you're visiting with us today, I want to extend a very special welcome to you. I'm Pastor Tom, and I'll be glad to talk with you after the service. If there's any way our church can serve you, if you have questions about our church, please see me. Also, in the pew in front of you, there's a blue card for visitors. Please fill that out and drop that in the offering plate. And also a reminder that we'll be praying later in our service. So if you have a prayer request, please write those prayer requests down and drop those in the offering plate as well. Let's take a few moments to greet one another and say hello to your neighbor. All right, all right, let's get it back together. I know, summertime's here. My wife's all burned up from laying on the beach. Everybody's fired up. It's great to be in the house of the Lord and fellowship with one another. That's what it's all about. At this point in our worship, we're going to be obedient to God's orders, and we're going to give him back that portion of the offering, the blessings that he bestows upon us if our ushers will come forward. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we praise you for the spirit of unity and fellowship in this church. We thank you for the love that we share with one another that we got from you. We ask, Father, that at this time, as we give back a portion of these tithes and offerings from the blessings that you bestow upon us every day, that you take these, Father, and use them in the furtherance of your word. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. Amen. A couple announcements this morning. Teenagers breakfast, Tuesday, July the 9th at 8 a.m. at Brown's. Today, the ladies craft group at 11.30 will meet, and they will be doing quilling, not quilting. Now, ooh. No sewing, quilling, not quilting. No idea what that means, but... <laughs> Rice Pan Ministries, June 30th, 11. Please remember to have things taken care of there. We have an uh, uh, important meeting this afternoon, immediately following church for the medical response team. Anybody who is EMT or trained in medical response, please hang around. It's going to be a very brief meeting to describe some of the equipment and stuff that we have here at the church as we move forward with our medical response team. If there's anybody who is interested in helping with that, please see Pastor Tom. At this time, we're going to have ministry minutes. We have Christy and Darlene coming to talk about some fundraising opportunities that are going to be happening here, unrelated but related. Who's going first? Okay, so July 13th is our Seven Valleys Community Yard Sale. Last year, we... Um, raise money for the DR for the uniforms, and it was a great turnout. So we will be doing this again this year. We'll be selling spaces to sell your items. It's a parking lot space, which is $10, and the yard sale itself is going to be eight to one. Um, set up, last year I said seven, but we had people here at 5.30 a.m. So I guess I'll be here at 5.30, so. Yeah. Um, like I said, this money will go towards the DR school uniforms. And if you don't want a yard sale spot, but you do want to give a donation to go towards that, let me know. And also, if you have items, but you don't want it to 
you can't be here that day, please let me know also for that. We can work something out um, that somebody can man that table, and then the, all of that proceeds would go towards the DR also. Um, so see me to sign up. There is a insurance form that you have to sign out, and we also, um, Mom made flyers up, so if, they, if you can hang them at your job, if you just want to take one along, whatever, I have flyers today with me, otherwise they'll be out on the um, brown table. So as they say, one man's junk is another man's treasure. sermon so I'm not doing a sermon but <laughs> so on Sunday afternoon the day after the yard sale if you um, aren't able to partake in that we are going to do something different we are going to have a Norwex party in the basement after church we will have a light lunch and then the consultant will be here at one o'clock she will tell you all about it if you would like to have a clean, healthy home, this is the way to go. They are uh, cloths that you use, special cloths that you use to clean, and you only use water. Water, H2O, you know what that is? <laughs> yeah, no window sprays, no chemicals, no uh, furniture polish for your furniture. You just use this. I have it a long time. I love it. It's a little mitt. It's called a dust cloth. Okay? So little mitts you can put on your hand. This is for adults. And if you so wish, you can put your children to work. <laughs> and they are also really good. You put your hands in and then you can do friction and it kind of gets. I use this day to dust my living room and I didn't dust for three weeks. I hate to dust. <laughs> I do. Just ask my children and they will tell you. <laughs> but you know, even now, I dusted maybe a couple weeks ago. There's a little, you know how like in a couple days you see that big layer of dust on your furniture, you know? I can I have to actually go and take my finger and see if it's any there. So, you know, it's so much nicer than, you know, the two days or whatever, and you have all them back. This kind of picks it up and you <coughs> take it outside. So it's a lot. Okay. And this is the other little magic cloth. This is called an Enviro cloth. This is the one you use. It's not an all purpose thing, it's got lots of silver in it. So it uh, uh, picks up some of your bacteria and your. some of those they they know what it's all about so <laughs> but this is so you can learn more that sunday afternoon and it's norwex
vision oh king of my heart nothing else satisfies only you Lord. you are my best Lord, by day or by night waking or sleeping your presence my Or man's empty praise You're my inheritance now and always You and you only The first in my heart I king of heaven My treasure you are We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, and we
said unto them, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Let's seek the Lord today. thirsty desert ground in a dry and barren land I bow down I need you now you are calling I will come to
I ever needed you, I need you now. Holy. God, as we come to your house this morning, we come declaring our need and our dependence upon you. Lord, earlier this morning, we had a, a show of hands of virtually every hand was in the air this week of a time when we faced something before us. And God, we, we needed to rely on your strength. God, thank you that you are there for us. Thank you that you are always ready to hear our cry. And thank you, God, for your promise that you are with us. God, as we come into the, your presence today, we're also aware of our sinfulness. We're aware that this week we've thought things that we shouldn't think. We've said things we should not have said. We've done things we should not have done. And so Lord, we confess those sins to you now. And we're grateful for the cleansing and the healing that comes through your son. It's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Everybody can have a seat, and all of our children can go with uh, Mrs. Markey to our Children of God time. For everyone staying in the sanctuary, take out your Bibles and uh, put your thumb in the book of Numbers, and uh, also in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to be sort of uh, flip back and forth between Corinthians and the book of Numbers this morning for a reason that'll become come apparent pretty quickly. Our culture is obsessed with the rich and famous. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, all have the distinction of being household names for most of us because of their vast fortunes. But for each of them, that wasn't always the case. None of the, these three men inherited their fortune. All of them started with nothing and built massive companies from it. Bill Gates founded and developed a little company that you might have heard of, Microsoft. His operating system is on most business computers and most of our home computers, not only in our country, but around the world. He started the company with an idea and a plan and a dream, and it's now one of the largest country companies in the world. Warren Buffett is chairman and CEO of the investing company called Berkshire Hathaway. He began investing at, get this, parents, the age of 10. 10. He bought three shares of stock when he was 10 years old in a company nobody, has, nobody none of us will have heard of, Cities Services. So from those three shares that he spent roughly $100 on way back then, that was a lot of money back in the late 40s, early 50s, today he's the third wealthiest person in the world with a fortune approaching $100 billion. Three shares of stock when he was 10 to a $100 billion portfolio today. In 1994, Jeff Bezos started another small company you might have heard of called Amazon. It began as an online bookstore, remember that? He was one of the first online bookstores way back when. And today its products and services are ones we all use, from technology to music streaming to clothing. Virtually every internet search you do is going to come up with Amazon somewhere in the top 10 hit list. Well, these three men are the embodiment of the American dream. If you have an idea and you work hard and you hire the right staff around you, you can make yourself in anything you want to be. Many would say that Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos are self-made men. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he had a huge concern for them. They were in danger of seeing themselves as spiritually self-made. He knew he had to address the problem, and we turn in our text today to chapter 10 as we're working through this book of 1 Corinthians throughout the year, and we'll see how Paul dealt with this problem of those Corinthians feeling like they were spiritually self-made. Verse 1, 
I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written down for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. The Corinthian church had many problems as we've been learning as we work through this book. In fact, the whole book of 1 Corinthians is dealing with those problems over and over and over again. Paul was trying to correct wrong-headed thinking, wrong belief that they got off on some tangents along the way. In the text we just read, Paul had to deal with the problem of complacency or said another way, the problem of self-reliance. The danger of self-reliance is this. You think you're all about that. And Paul uses the nation of Israel as an illustration to explain how the Corinthians were in a danger, dangerous place. Notice how Paul connected the nation of Israel to the church at Corinth. Verse 1, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So let's take a little bit step back. If you're not familiar with Israel's history, these two verses might be foreign to you. So the nation of Israel was founded when God came to Father Abraham and said, you will be the progeny of a, of a great nation and your descendants will come into this land called Canaan, what we know now as modern-day Israel, and they will possess this land, and through them, all peoples in the world will be blessed. Well, Abraham settled there in the land of Canaan. He had a son, Isaac. Isaac had a son, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, and because of famine, those 12 sons and Jacob all ended up in the country of Egypt. There, they lived for over 400 years as slaves to the Pharaoh in Egypt. And God heard the cries of the Israelites there, and he sent a man named Moses to go down and bring them out of their slavery. So Moses goes and through a series of 10 plagues upon Pharaoh and upon the land of Egypt, ultimately Pharaoh's heart was softened when his son died, and he allowed the Israelites to go. And then Moses led the Israelites into the wilderness where they wandered for 40 years. During that period of time, Israel experienced God's spiritual blessings. Notice what Exodus chapter 13, 21 says. As the Israelites left Egypt... The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day so they would know the direction to go to lead them. And at nighttime, there was a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So wouldn't that be pretty cool in your life? If there was a cloud overhead, the Lord leading, and everywhere the cloud went, that's where you went. Or if it was nighttime and you were out, there was a pillar of fire. So if danger was over there, the pillar of fire would take you this way so you would avoid the danger. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? And initially, Israel was like, wow, this is really cool. There's a cloud and there's a pillar of fire. But think about that. If every morning you crawled out of your tent and you looked out 
the first morning that pillar of fire would be there as the day was breaking and think, wow, that's really cool. But after a week of that, a month of that, several months of that, maybe even a year of that, you'd come to expect it, wouldn't you? Like, ah, the pillar of fire is always going to be there. It's always been there. It'll always be there. And that's the trap that Israel fell into. They began to forget the presence of God was with them, and they began to take it for granted. Yes, the presence and protection of the Lord was there, but they began to not appreciate God's presence with them and what he was doing for them, and that led into some sins, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. But the presence and protection of the Lord wasn't the only blessing they had. They also had deliverance by the Lord. When Pharaoh had decided to let the Israelites go, many of you know this story, they headed away and they they came upon the Red Sea, which wouldn't have been a big deal. They just could have went around the sea, except that Pharaoh had changed his mind by then, and so his army was behind them. And so Israel had nowhere to go. There was an army behind them. There was the sea before them. And God said, I'm going to show them once again that I am the great God. And so he parted the sea. Exodus 14, this is what Moses did. He lifted up his staff, he stretched his hand over the sea, and it divided. And most of you know the story, right? The Israelites go through on dry land while the sea is parted. And when Pharaoh's army followed after the Israelites, the sea came back together and drowned all the warriors for Egypt. And so God delivered Israel once again by his hand. If the pillar of fire at night and the pillar of cloud by day wasn't enough, they had this great memory of the sea splitting. And again, the day after, you can imagine, they were all high-fiving each other and celebrating and praising the Lord. Man, wasn't that awesome to to walk through the sea and know that God had, had protected us? But a week later, a month later, a year later, that memory sort of started to fade and the miraculous sort of went away. Third, God identified with them through their passage through the Red Sea. Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 10 that they were all baptized into Moses. Notice what Exodus 14, 31 says, when Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. I would hope so. Feared there means reverence, worship, all respect. They, they worshiped the Lord. They believed in the Lord. If they didn't believe before when they had seen the 10 plagues upon Israel, when they were delivered through the Red Sea and God showed them his miraculous power, then more of them began to believe. And Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 10 that they were baptized into Moses through this experience. Now, it wasn't a water baptism as we think about baptism. They didn't go into specifically water and be dunked and be brought back up, although they did pass through uh, the Red Sea. The spiritual significance is much like our baptism. Our baptism happens at the moment when we trust and believe in Jesus Christ and is not necessarily indicative of whether we are dunked and baptized or not. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 12, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, which we looked at a few weeks ago, says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the, the baptism that Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 10 it was a significance for Israel that the Holy Spirit was with them, was guiding them, was leading them through Moses, God. God's spokesman. They were identified with the Lord as they believed what God was doing for them. And fourth, Israel experienced God's physical protection, excuse me, physical provision and spiritual provision. Notice what verses 3, 4, and 5 say. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. So there was a physical sustenance that God provided. Remember what he gave them? 
He gave them manna, which is angels' food. That was their food every day. Every morning when they woke up, there was manna on the ground for them to consume and have sustenance. So God was providing for them through the physical food, through the manna, through the angels' food that was there for them. And in the same way, God was providing for them spiritually. God continues to provide for us today. God continues to give us the spiritual bread that we need. Notice what Jesus said. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. When Jesus said that, he wasn't promising manna for us. He was promising us the spiritual provision of himself. He is the bread of life. Remember, when we take in the Lord's Supper, we we take a piece of bread and we consume that bread to remember Jesus' profession here, that he is the provision of the bread of life. He is the sustenance that we need. He is the spiritual provision that God has made for us for eternal life. God just didn't provide manna for them. He also provided water for them to drink. In Exodus chapter 17 is the story of the Israelites grumbling because they didn't have water. And so uh, Moses did this. He struck the rock and water is going to come out of it. And the people drank from the water that was there. That was, the, again, the physical provision. But what Paul is talking about here in, in chapter 10 is not just only the manna and the water that sustained them, but more importantly, the spiritual water that they gave. Remember Jesus in Samaria? He meets this woman at the well, and she's come with a bucket to draw water out of the well. And Jesus says, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. The water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That's what Paul was pointing to here for Israel, saying Israel had God providing for them everything they needed for life and for salvation and eternal life. God was providing for them. They had the physical and spiritual provision for the Lord, and the one giving it to them was Jesus Christ. They couldn't see the Christ. They were looking forward to one day the Messiah, the Savior that would come. And Paul here makes clear the one sustaining Israel through those times was Christ himself. And Paul makes the connection from the Israelites back then in the 1400s BC to us today. He is the one that continues to bring provision and blessing to Christians, to the Corinthians, and by extension, to us today. But here's the problem that Israel fell into. They thought God would always be there for them. In fact, many of them spurned the Lord's provision. They got used to it. They got used to the manna being there every day. They got used to miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Sort of became ho-hum experience for them, believe it or not. And ultimately what happened is they fell into sin. Look what Paul says in in verses 5 and 6. Nevertheless, with most of them, with most of the Israelites, God was not well pleased for they were laid low in the wilderness. Keep in mind, they wandered for 40 years there. Now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave the evil things that they also did. So Paul begins to recount some of Israel's sins. He said that they desired evil. And what happened was they began to crave things that God was not providing. I mean, think about all these things that God was giving them. And then they began to crave things that they didn't have. Now, meat in and of itself is not evil. But the problem the Israelites had was they were critical of what God provided for them. Namely, the manna and the water, it wasn't enough. A few weeks, a few months down the road, what God was providing got to be humdrum and and wasn't enough for them. They wanted more. Numbers chapter 11 says this, The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again. Now keep, keep in mind here that these were slaves for 400 years and God had finally released them for slavery. And what's the first thing they want to do? We remember the fish we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. 
But now our appetite is, go- appetite is gone and there's nothing to look at except this manna. They were slaves and they wanted to go back to Egypt because that was better in slavery and to have cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic rather than have God providing for them every day in freedom. And if this were an isolated incident or if this were just a one-time event, it probably wouldn't have been a big deal. But if you've read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and know the rest of Israel's deliverance and ultimate ultimately coming into into the promised land, you know that there was only two men who survived those 40 years because of their grumbling, because of their unhappiness with God. The Israelites were never satisfied. And I want you to notice how Paul picked up five sins that the Israelites struggled with. And I want you to notice how those five sins were problems at the church at Corinth. And I want you to track with me to today, to the 21st century, and see if you see those five sins prominent in our culture today. Are we Americans ever satisfied with what God provides? I'll be honest, I'm not. It's always about the next big thing with us, with us Americans, isn't it? We have a craving problem, and it's caused massive problems in our culture. Our national debt of our country, our government, now stands at $22 trillion dollars. That means our government owes creditors $97,620 for every one of us. So just about $100,000 our country owes foreign debtors for every one of us. And our national debt is growing at a trillion dollars a year. So it's growing at about $3,000 more per person per year. According to an April 2019 Wall Street Journal report, Americans owe just over a trillion dollars in personal credit card debt. About 40% of us pay off our credit card debt every month. However, the remaining 60% carry balances month to month, with the average balance being just over $6,000. Here's what this report found. Individuals with high credit card balances tend to have common traits. The more cards, the more income, the more the people owed. So the whole idea, the more you make, the more you'll save is not true. Apparently, according to this Wall Street Journal article, the more you make, the more you spend. Paul says here, these things served as examples for us that we would not crave the evil things. So Israel had a craving problem. Secondly, they had an idolatry problem. Look at verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Famous story in Exodus chapter 32. Again, keep in mind what we, we just recounted with Israel's history. God had miraculously delivered them from slavery. They had been protected as they went through the Red Sea. They had the pillar of Cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. God's presence was with them. And what's one of the first things they did when they got settled and put up a camp? They set up a golden calf and they began to worship that calf as the one who had delivered them from Israel. Like, hello, people. Like, what are you thinking? Like, that calf delivered you from, from Pharaoh? Crazy, isn't it? But again, before we get too harsh on the Israelites, let's take a look around ourselves. We're a country that's obsessed with beauty. While it's true we don't have golden statues in our country, at least none that that I see on a regular basis, that people are bowing down and worship, we nonetheless have an idolatry problem. And the idolatry problem with our country is celebrity worship. When a new movie is coming out, people will line up And they'll spend hours, even days, to be the first one to see the new movie. Some will camp out for two, three, or four or more days to get a coveted concert ticket to see their favorite singer. Guilty. Been there, done that, got the ticket stub to prove it. Every move of Kim Kardashian is photographed and put on Instagram for the world to see and for her millions of followers to oogle. Americans spend about $16 billion a year on cosmetic surgery. And it's all the cosmetic surgery that you would think about. Liposuction, having noses done, tummy tucks, all kinds of other stuff. 
including Botox treatment, all that stuff. That's the obsession. That's the idolatry of our country today, obsession with beauty. Israel's third sin was sexual immorality. We covered this in depth in chapters 5, 6, and 7, so we won't rehash all the statistics and figures in our country to show its relevance today, but suffice it to say that our country has an ongoing and persistent issue with sexual immorality today. Today, Christians commit the same sins of adultery, fornication, and all the other sexual sins that Israel did way back then. Fourth, Israel's sin was testing God. Paul writes in verse 9, let us not try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. In Numbers chapter 1, 21 is the story where the water and manna was not enough. And so they begged God and complained against Moses for not having meat to eat. And so God provided quail and they had an overabundance of of meat to sustain them. Listen to John MacArthur's insightful view on what Israel did here in in demanding meat from God. God had provided manna to eat and water to drink, but the people weren't satisfied. They wanted more variety and more spice. They complained and complained, questioning God's goodness and trying his patience. They had no concern for pleasing God, only for pleasing themselves. They did not use their newfound freedom to better serve him, but to demand instead that he serve them better. Fast forward 1,400 years to the Corinthians. Many of them were pushing their own liberty to the limits to see how much flesh they could indulge and how much of the world they could enjoy. They were trying God, and they were risking severe discipline from the Lord, just the same as some Christians today. Fast forward 2,000 years. Many Christians today would say, this is the age of grace. We're free. God's good. He's forgiving. doesn't matter what I do. He'll forgive us anyway. I can't lose my salvation, so what does it matter? Friends, that's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous place to be. It's like playing with fire. Eventually, you'll get burned. Many Christians today test God. And praise God, he is compassionate and loving and forgiving. But as Israel showed, there is a limit to when God brings forth his discipline. And the fifth sin of Israel was complaining. It was complaining. Notice what verse 10 says. Do not grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. In Numbers chapter 16 is the story where Korah, And several of his family members rose up in rebellion against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And all who were with Korah went to his side and said, we want Korah to lead us, not Moses. And God says, okay. Moses says, okay, we'll see who who God is with. If he's with Korah, then let him be our new leader. And if not, then let those people perish. And that's exactly what happened Those who sided with Korah were over 15,000 and they perished for complaining against God and against his designated leader, Moses. I don't want to depress you. That's not the goal of this morning. The goal of this morning is to point out that we have an example in Israel to call each one of us to a deeper dependence on Christ. Paul said in verse 11, now these things happened to them, to Israel, as an example. And they were written down for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he doesn't fall. The psalmist recounted this whole bit of Israel. Psalm 106, listen carefully to the words. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindness, but they rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for the sake of his name, that he might make his power known. Thus he rebuked the Red Sea and dried it up, and he led them through the deeps as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of the one who hated them. And he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Many people, when they're reading the Bible, think there are two two gods represented in Scripture. 
They see the God in the Old Testament as a mean and nasty and angry God that's full of vengeance. And then they see God in the New Testament as a God of love and compassion and care and grace. But nothing could be further from the truth. God is the same yesterday and today and forever. God's deliverance of Israel was a means of grace. His provision for them in spite of their sins was a means of his grace. God's mercy over a sinful and rebellious people were all measures of his amazing grace toward that nation. And he is the same gracious God to us today. So in the midst of God's blessing and provision, church, let's maintain humility. Proverbs 16 says, pride goes before destruction. If you think about Korah and all of those who followed him, if you think about those men who rebelled against God for only giving them bread and water, if you think about those stories, their number one pride was, their number one problem, their number one sin was pride. They were not humble before the Lord. They, they thought God owed them. Many in our country feel the same today. Let's remember to maintain humility before God who has blessed and provided for us. Now, secondly, falling into sin does not cause us to lose our salvation. John chapter 10, this is Jesus speaking. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So the goal of pointing these things out, Paul says, is is to bring us to repentance. The the example of Israel says we have some of those same sins in us. Let's not be like Israel who did not humble themselves and put them under the loving and tender and gracious and caring and forgiving hand of God Almighty. Let us not fall back on the fact that We were saved at whatever time and God's got us and we can do whatever we want and live in whatever heathenistic way we choose to until the time God calls us home or until his son returns. Yes, falling into sin doesn't cause us to lose our salvation and that's a wonderful assurance. But at the same time, it's not also a license to continue to sin in this life. Third, protect yourself from self-dependence and arrogance. Cultivate a relationship of dependence upon God leading you. I don't personally know the three men that I started out today's message with. What I do know about their public persona is there's no mention of God anywhere in their lives. There's no mention of them serving the Lord. There's no mention of giving God the credit for their vast wealth. Protect yourself from self-dependence and arrogance Cultivate that relationship where you depend upon God every day. Don't be like Israel. Don't be like the Corinthians. Paul is calling us here to a life of dependence upon Christ. Many in our churches today are spiritual lone wolves. They think that all they need is God and the Bible, and they don't need anyone else. But that's certainly not biblical. The importance of fellowship is stated all throughout scriptures in both the Old and the New Testament. Many people wrongly believe they don't need the support of fellow believers. They think they have the Holy Spirit in them and that's all they need. They got the scriptures and the Holy Spirit. I don't need anything else. And man, this came home to me this week. Those of you who are on Facebook, you know how devastated I was when a, when a young woman overdosed lady that I and another couple here at St. Peter's had spent years ministering to. I cared deeply for her and her kids. And our church tried everything that we could do for this family. But unfortunately, she was a spiritual lone wolf. She allowed herself to be out of fellowship and wouldn't come here to worship and serve and get plugged in. And now her two very small children have to figure out how they're going to live without a mom anymore. And it's breaking me inside. It really is. Don't allow your freedom, Christ, to lead you toward indulgence. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, you're called to freedom, but don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. 
but through love serve one another. Brother Jerry talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we covered chapter 8. The issue of the day was eating meat sacrificed to idols. And isn't that interesting how it's woven through even chapter 10 where we see the issue of meat. And the issue is not whether you eat meat or not. That's not the issue. The issue is something that they put before the Lord. So don't allow your freedom in Christ to lead you into an indulgence. We are free for sure and there's plenty of things we can do, but not everything we can do should we do. Because there are plenty of things in our lives that would be enslaving to us and we should stay away from them because they can lead us to indulgence and ultimately into sin and headed down the path that Israel went. And finally, friends, let's remember that God's grace is available to all, to all who turn to him. Titus chapter 2 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. God was at work with the Israelites. Remember what Paul said here? It was Christ was the one that was providing and sustaining for them. Then he was the one providing and sustaining the church in Corinth. And he is the one that's providing and sustaining us today in 2019. So let's turn to him in his grace. Let's call upon him in his mercy. Let's turn from our sin and let's humble ourselves under his mighty hand today you've never believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then do it today. We, this text on the screen, grace of God has appeared through Jesus Christ. Salvation is available to all who turn to him. You simply need to humble yourself and say, Lord, I cannot save myself. I need a Savior, and thank God you are that Savior, Jesus. And I turn to you now. If you would do that today, in a few moments we're going to pray. Pastor Jerry and one of our elders will be up here at the altar. They'd be honored to pray with you and pray for you with that. Let's pray now. God, thank you for the nation of Israel. And thank you for the promises that come through that nation, through the hope and promise of a Savior who we know is Jesus the Christ, who died for us, who shed his blood for us. And by his stripes, we are healed. By him, we have the promise of everlasting life, a promise of eternity with you that cannot be taken away. And God, thank you for your scriptures, which call us to do some self-examination here this morning. Lord, many of us feel that we're self-made. We have, we've made ourselves, perhaps like Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos, but nothing could be further from the truth. Because first of all, God, you gave us everything that we have. And you've put us in this time, in this place where we could earn a living, where we could be fairly independent. And so, God, the text this morning is a, is a warning sign to us in our culture that we need you, God. We sang about that this morning, of how much we need you. And God, we're mindful of that every day. Lord, let us not become self sufficient, self-sustaining. God, may we always be bowing before you and humbling ourselves under your mighty and merciful and gracious hand. And now, Lord, here are times of intercession as Brother Jerry comes to lift them up just now. As a church, we lift up together the following prayers to you, Lord. On behalf of our brothers and sisters, we lift up Father Henry, Irene's brother. We praise you and we thank you for his recovery so far. We just ask, Lord, that you continue to strengthen him and guide him, guide those helping him through his recovery, Father. Oh, we want to lift up Raymond this morning for healing of his ears so that uh, his return to the DR coming up here shortly, Lord can be a possibility and that there won't be any surgery necessary. We just ask, Lord, that you continue to heal and touch his ears, Father. Lord, we lift up those in Bate 9, suffering, Father, with the waterborne illness, Lord. We ask that you strengthen their bodies and guard them against the diseases that are there, Father, and the issues with their water. We just ask, Lord, that you help them touch that water supply, Lord, that no one else should fall to this. And our Father, this morning, we lift up the Fisher family. Father, the loss of a wife and a mother unexpectedly on Friday, we just ask, Father, that you touch them in their grief, Lord. 
help to heal their hearts, Father. And we just ask, Lord, that through this tough time, that if anyone can come to know you or become closer to you, we just ask, Lord, that you would continue to, to guide the words of each and every person who comes in contact with them throughout this time. We ask all these things and for any other unspoken request, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand now and sing our closing song. And if you're in need of prayer at all, Brother Jerry will be here to, to pray with you. you for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. But Father, I pray that we would not take that for granted and that we would live for you each and every day, Father, that we would try to do our best to not sin against you, Father. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for the forgiveness that you do give when we do fall short. Father, I just thank you for bringing us into this place that we can worship your great name. But Lord, I pray that we would be able to go out of this place and continue to praise you, Lord, and worship you, to not let it here on a Sunday morning, but to take it with us. Father, that people can see a difference in us because we love Jesus. Father, we just thank you. We praise you for all that you do for us. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming and have a great day.